Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IMS uh, webinar. This webinar was supported by a restricted educational grant from Business Healthcare. And Business Healthcare had no role in the selection of topics, selection of speakers, and have not vetted or reviewed the content of the speaker's presentation. Uh, I am uh, Professor Claudio Suarez from um, Queen's University here in Canada. Um, and it's really my great pleasure to be moderating this session today, which is entitled Brain Fog and Menopause, a Health Prof Healthcare Professional's Guide for Decision-Making Counseling on Cognition. Uh, I am delighted to have the two very distinguished speakers with me today, uh, very good friends and colleagues in the field. Uh, the first talk that will be given will be by Professor Pauline Mackey. Uh, professor Mackey is a professor of psychiatry, psychology, and obstetrics and gynecology, University of Illinois College of Medicine. She's also the past president of the North American Menopause Society and currently trustee of the International Menopause Society. Uh, Professor Mackey received her PhD from University of Minnesota and did a postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins in U.S. Um, and the National Institute of Aging. She's been uh, a leading force in the field for the past 25 years uh, doing research on women and menopausal uh, continually funded by the National Institute of Health and NIH. Uh, Dr. Mackey has more than 200 publications on menopause and brain health and is really known for her discovery and neuro targets for hormonal therapy. Uh, she won many awards, including the 2018 Women in Science Award from the American Medical Women's Association and the uh, NANS Award for Outstanding Research. And in 2022, she received the Faculty of the Year Award from the UIC College of Medicine. Uh, Professor Mackey also has met many NIH awards for her research and service, and has been really a leading in this field. Uh, her research uh, really addresses uh, most of the important issues in women's health, including whether women experience a change in their cognitive abilities, her mood, and her brain functioning as they transition to menopause. Uh, it also looking at the effects of menopause symptoms and hormonal changes on cognition and brain function, which is the main uh, focus of her talk today entitled Menopause and Brain Fog, Evidence-Based Messaging for the Provider. So without further ado, uh, help me to please welcome Professor Mackey. Pauline. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you and a great honor to be presenting with uh, Dr. Jaff on this important topic. Uh, today, we're going to be presenting on a topic that is the subject of a new white paper that we had the great privilege of preparing for the International Menopause Society. Uh, the IMS does prepare a white paper every year for World Menopause Day, which is October 18th, and this year's focuses on cognition. So in the first part of today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on menopause and brain fog evidence-based messaging for the provider. And here are my disclosures. I consult widely for pharma. Um, thankfully, they're focusing on cognitive endpoints, which is a, a nice uh, advance in the field. So the topics that I will cover in the first half of our webinar today are, what do we mean uh, by brain fog? How does cognitive function change in the menopause? What menopause-related factors appear to influence cognition? What role does menopausal hormone therapy play? So what do we mean by brain fog? So by brain fog, we mean the constellation of cognitive symptoms that women experience around the time of the menopause. These symptoms most frequently manifest in terms of difficulty learning and remembering items, difficulty attending, and if you listen to your patients, they might say you, that they have a difficult time recalling words, recalling names, stories, numbers. They might seem distracted, have difficulty maintaining a train of thought, and they might say that they walk into a room and forget why they're there. In addition, there's this kind of general fogginess where they feel kind of unfocused and have a difficult time uh, switching between uh, different tasks. There's an interesting phenotype of cognitive symptoms that uh, Dr. Neil Epperson has uh, 
discussed in some of her articles that I like to also highlight. And this is a presentation that focuses more on ADHD-like symptoms or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder symptoms, which are difficulties organizing, prioritizing, and activating to work, difficulty with focusing and sustaining and shifting attention, regulating alertness, sustaining effort, and processing speed, and managing frustration in modulating emotions. Um, in addition, the cognitive symptom of this particular profile, which is not the cognitive symptom that we typically see in longitudinal studi uh, studies, is one that shows deficits in the area of um, working memory, which is the ability to hold information in your mind and kind of manipulate it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the scope of work here. Are women on a path to dementia once they transition through the menopause? Let's think about this logically because I do believe there's a great deal of misunderstanding about what cognitive symptoms and brain changes that the menopause portend for later brain health. So are women on a path to dementia once they transition through the menopause? Thinking about it logically doesn't make sense, right? Because all women who transition through the menopause will live into late life, right? They're gonna live into late life, but most women will not develop dementia. So only a fraction of this universal experience leads to dementia. So um, dementia is not causally linked to um, the, men the menopause. Now, lifetime risk of Alzheimer's disease um, for women in the United States is about 19.5% uh, at age 45 and 21% at age 65. So the majority of women will not get dementia. Now, the risk of Alzheimer's disease depends on biological sex and geographical location. There are higher rates, lifetime risk among women than men and higher rates in Europe, in North America than in Asia, Africa, and South America. One key messaging for clinicians is to reassure women that unless they have a family history of early onset Alzheimer's disease, Dementia at midlife is very rare. It's only 293 cases per 100,000 women globally. So very reassuring information for women. Um, let's uh, now move on to the take home messages which are in our white paper. So from the first part, menopause brain fog refers to the constellation of cognitive symptoms experienced by women around the menopause, frequently manifesting in a memory and attention difficulties. These cognitive changes should not be confused with dementia. Dementia is rare at before age 64. And then despite some research suggesting that menopause-related cognitive problems may ultimately lead to dementia later in life, cognitive problems are common, and we'll see this. And just logically, although all women transition through the menopause, the large majority will not develop dementia. So key take-home messages for the provider to share with their patients. So what do we know about what, uh, what happens to cognition as women transition through the menopause? Well, thankfully, we know a lot. And this is because there are now six large longitudinal studies that have followed women from the time they're pre-menopause to the time they're post-menopause that have given objective cognitive tests and looked to see what changes as women transition through the menopause. This slide shows those six studies, shows the cognitive domains that they assessed. And if there's an X there, it means that that cognitive domain was assessed. If there's a red X, it means that that cognitive domain was one that showed changes in the perimenopause and changes means declines. So what do you see here? You see a lot of red X's around verbal learning and verbal memory. So very reliably in these longitudinal studies, women experience a decline in verbal learning and memory as they transition through the menopause with some um, some studies showing changes in other cognitive domains like processing speed um, and our work showing changes in attention and working memory, kind of like that ADHD phenotype that Neil Epperson has discussed. Verbal memory. So this is what you're doing right now. You're taking in verbal information 
uh, from this webinar and you're encoding it in memory in the lab and in the clinic setting, we test this with a wordless learning test. Test is interesting for a number of reasons. One is that this is a test that females um, surpass men on. It's the inverse of the male advantage in visual spatial abilities, so that's interesting. And this is the test that's most sensitive, not only to menopause, but to um, ovariectomy. It's also most sensitive to Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, so a very important cognitive domain. And so when your patients say, I'm having a difficult time learning and remembering, we can validate this. We see this in longitudinal studies, and it emerges in the perimenopause when the hormonal changes begin. Now, for most women, the cognitive changes are temporary. For women of color in the United States, and unfortunately, we don't have longitudinal studies of women in middle income or low income um, countries. But um, to the extent that we can generalize from this population in the US where education is low, uh, food resources may be low, lots of chronic stress, it may be that there's a subgroup of individuals who are more vulnerable to cognitive changes. And so in this study, what we found is that women did show this emergence of difficulties in learning and memory, as well as to a lesser extent, attention and working memory. And interestingly, in this population, this effect was sustained. It was maintained in the postmenopause. So there are some groups of women for whom the menopause transition um, represents the emergence of vulnerability, but this is not the case for all women. So lots of individual differences. Now, when your patients say, I'm having difficulties with my cognitive function, you know, how real are those? How, have these complaints been validated? And they really have. Although it might be surprising that for most people, we're not a really good judge of how well we're doing on memory tests. For midlife women, they're actually very good. And there's a strong correlation between the severity of the cognitive complaint and the magnitude of the difficulty that they're having. So validate their complaints. Longitudinal studies produce reliable evidence of these menopause-related declines in cognition. But is this cognitive impairment? The answer is no. The average level of cognitive performance remains in the normal range, despite the fact that we can measure these cognitive changes. How many women are susceptible to more, uh, more severe cognitive issues? In the study that I just showed you of low-income women of color in the United States, about 11 to 13% of those women had cognitive changes that were in the area of cognitive impairment, meaning that the decline from the pre-menopause represented, represented one that was well below what you'd expect for age and education. So about one in, one in 10 women might experience um, a clinically significant decline in cognition. And that's an important group to consider. Um, do these changes resolve in the menopause, in the post-menopause? Not for all women, as we just showed, but for most women, yes. It might differ depending on the cognitive domain. So there's some evidence um, that difficulties learning what you're doing right now may persist somewhat in, in a mild form into the postmenopause. But the difficulties that women have recalling information what, once it's in memory seems to bounce back. So most of this bounces back. And again, it's all within the normal range. Um, who may be more vulnerable to these cognitive issues? These are women with low cognitive reserves. So this is a, a, a term that comes out of the field of neurology. The idea is that the better your cognitive function early in life, the more reserve you have, the more of a hit that your cognitive performance can take before it manifests in an impairment. So how do we build brain reserve through good education, through engaging occupations, uh, through IMS webinars, and through uh, leisure activities that put demands on cognition. We think too, from work that I'll show next, that women with persistent menopausal symptoms may very well be especially vulnerable to cognitive uh, difficulties, important messaging for the menopause provider. And then of course, there's genetics, physical health, mental health, and life stressors, which Dr. Jaff will talk about. 
So now that we've gone through the idea that you have to validate patients' complaints, especially those that are in learning and memory, that these are likely to emerge in the perimenopause, um, and that for most women, um, these are well within the normal range. Now let's talk a little bit about what menopause-related factors appear to influence cognition. And so let's uh, just begin by recognizing that the brain is an organ replete with estrogen receptors, and it's uh, replete in areas of the brain that subserve what you're doing right now. So learning in the hippocampus and in the prefrontal cortex, in areas of the brain that regulate emotion. Um, so, so it makes sense that estrogen would play a role based on its neurobiology. To understand a causal role of estrogen in these cognitive complaints, we can turn to surgical menopause and ask what happens when you take a premenopausal woman and um, remove the ovaries surgically, do you see a worsening of cognition? And indeed, uh, Barbara Sherwin, the matriarch of our field, demonstrated this many years ago, that removal of the ovaries produces a decline in verbal memory that's reversed with estrogen. So that's evidence of a causal role of estrogen. Similar effects are observed with GNRH analogs when you have pharmacological suppression of estradiol. You see this same thing that is reversed with ADVAC estrogen. So certainly we think because of the specific effect that it has on verbal learning and memory, that estrogen plays a role. Meta-analyses show that women who undergo surgical menopause do show this reliable effect um, on verbal um, memory, as well as two other cognitive abilities that women show an advantage of compared to men, which includes semantic memory and processing speed. What about hot flashes? Let's not, um, uh, let's not miss the important role of treating hot flashes. So if you get one message from me today, that's the one. Uh, women underreport their hot flashes. We measure these objectively with ambulatory skin conductance monitors. You see here a woman with 37 hot flashes. Uh, women have hot flashes on average for seven years. 33% of women have them for more than 10 years, and they're prevalent in 60 to 65 year old women. So we see these in our own studies. So very frequent as many years after the final menstrual period into the period of risk for dementia and the like. And we have lots of data to suggest that these hot flashes play a role in um, cognitive dysfunction, even when you account for sleep. We don't yet know the mechanism. The NIA has funded us to um, look into this. We see these associations in um, healthy women. We see them in women with breast cancer. And then when we put women into a brain scan and we ask them to learn words and we call them, we see that there is a direct increase in the amount that the brain needs to work um, in relation to the number of hot flashes women have. We did publish a proof of concept study using something called stellate ganglion blockade that if you treat those hot flashes, memory bounces back. So in theory, hot flashes may be a reversible uh, cause of memory problems in women. So treat the hot flashes. Sleep, we know, is a risk factor for cognitive dysfunction. You don't have to have a PhD in neuroscience to know that. You, as menopause practitioners, you know how your brain functions when you're sleep deprived. Women have chronic uh, sleep disturbance oftentimes during the menopause transition and indeed in a longitudinal study led by Mia Weber, where cognitive function was assessed every six months um, in a group of women. So really intensively, the women who were vulnerable to memory problems, which was about 20% of this cohort, they were women with the sleep problems. So a really important role for sleep. Interestingly, in that study too, women who had steady levels of estradiol were more vulnerable. So sleep is related. And of course, we know that women wake up when they have hot flashes. And so the role of hot flashes in sleep are important, but as shown, they're two different causal arrows. They can be associated. So sleep is important to treat and hot flashes is important to sleep. Depression, the area of expertise that uh, Dr. Suarez brings um, to our field 
is important. We and others have shown that even mild symptoms of depression are linked to memory problems in midlife. So treating depression is important. So low mood, changing levels of estradiol, vasomotor symptoms, and poor sleep all converge to affect verbal memory at this time. So what role does hormone therapy play? So we, are, uh, we have the great uh, benefit of having four large randomized trials of hormone therapy in early postmenopause, so after the final menstrual period, showing neutral effects of hormone therapy on cognition. Okay, so remember, when do the cognitive problems emerge in those longitudinal studies? They emerge in the perimenopause, right? So now what we're looking at is what happens when you treat after the perimenopause. We also said that cognitive function, if you will, rebounds in the postmenopause for most women. So it may not be the appropriate window of opportunity for cognitive function, but at least we know that it's um, neutral. I will say that the studies here um, excluded women with moderate to severe hot flashes, and it's, it's a, a huge gap in our literature. How does hormone therapy affect cognition in women with bothersome hot flashes? It's amazing that we don't know that. And importantly as well, how do hormone therapy and oral contraceptives affect cognition in the perimenopause? That we don't know, even though that's when cognition begins. So big gaps in our literature. Finally, I want to talk about the role of hormone therapy in Alzheimer's disease prevention. Is there a role? Now, here I'm um, taking new data, newish data from the Women's Health Initiative, where they followed the entire cohort of women, 27,347 women for 18 years after randomization. Um, and what was observed in this study is that there was a 26% reduced risk of death from Alzheimer's disease in that study, and a 15% uh, decreased risk if you combined the conjugated equine estrogen arm with the conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate arm. So that would suggest, in my mind, if you say, okay, Pauline, what's the strongest evidence that hormone therapy might prevent dementia? It's this one because it's randomized, it's a large group of women and they're followed for 18 years, okay? So if there's a hint in the literature for benefit, this might be it. But remember, these data contrast with the Women's Health Initiative, um, which followed women for uh, 5.2 years. And that's the one that led to the label on hormone therapy. So in that study, they looked at incident all-cause dementia, um, and what they found is that there was a two-fold risk of dementia among women randomized to hormone therapy, so harm. So the number needed to harm in this study to get one case of dementia was 436, okay? So that's what we have. That's what led to the black box warning. Let's say we're skeptical of that, or we think maybe it doesn't generalize to all formulations of hormone therapy or to all women. And we look to the study that I just reviewed with the 27,000 women. Let's say that that's what people believe and you know, they're leaning toward hormone therapy for preventing dementia. Well, I think it's important to take a step back because you'd need to treat 2,004 women based on the magnitude of uh, effect in that study to prevent one case of dementia, okay? So really important to put the likelihood of individual benefit into perspective when making um, decisions about hormone therapy. That's different for women who have their ovaries removed before age 50. For them, we want to put them on hormone therapy because of the beautiful work by Walter Rocha showing that it is associated with a decreased risk of dementia later in life. So based on current guidelines, hormone therapy is not recommended at any age to treat cognitive concerns at menopause or prevent cognitive decline or dementia. We don't know if hormone therapy has a different effect in women with hot flashes, and we don't know what happens when you start in the perimenopause. Two big gaps in the literature. Menopausal hormone therapy appears perfectly safe early in the menopause, and estrogen therapy among surgically menopausal women seems to be really important, especially if they transition um, early in life. 
Um, and estrogen therapy, even late in the postmenopause, appears to be safe for cognition. But we need to be very, very cautious in suggesting any benefit to an individual woman of using hormone therapy, given the number needed to treat. Um, so we've covered brain fog, what cognitive abilities change in the menopause, what menopause-related factors appear to contribute to cognitive changes, and the role of menopausal hormone therapy. And I want to thank you for your attention to that. I also want to um, share with you World Menopause Day is coming up. The IMS is going to be doing a lot of educational and promotion activities. We invite you to come to our website and take a look at those. And then also, I, I hope to see many of you in Lisbon uh, on October 26th to the 29th. There's going to be many, many people there. We're so excited to see you. Looking forward to a great program. So thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions. And go ahead and put them in the Q&A there, and we can address them in, in the Q&A after. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mackey, for the excellent presentation. We were looking forward to the Q&A. I have already a few questions waiting for you uh, at the end. Um, we're going to move forward um, with a presentation by Dr. Nicole Jaff. Uh, Dr. Jaff is, um, he received her PhD and her doctorate in 2015. Um, her work was on uh, women entering the endocrine um, entering transition, the SWEET study. Uh, where she examined the reproductive health in more than 700 uh, midlife Black urban South African women. It's the first study of its kind in that population. It really can be generalized to uh, women across uh, Africa, but also low-income countries. Um, Dr. Jaff has also a long-standing interest in, in global health and looking at the effect of reproductive aging in midlife women in low- and middle-income middle countries in general. Um, she's a member of and the Professional Board of Psychology in South Africa, a member of NAMS, a uh, certified menopause practitioner by NAMS and a council member of the South African Menopause Society, and also a member of IMS. Um, and looking at, um, she's also honorary lecturer for the Department of Chemical Pathology at Faculty of Sciences at University of uh, Wisconsin in South Africa and a research fellow at Aaron Institute. Um, Dr. Jaff received two NAMS awards, uh, one as a new investigator award in 2019, and the NAMS and Voda Community Serve Award in 2018. Her research has been presented in, in international conferences, and she's published uh, extensively in the field. Uh, and, and Dr. Jaff has really been a voice to provide uh, understandable evidence-based information to lay women on menopause. So please welcome Dr. Jaff for her presentation, Nicole. Thank you so much, Professor Suarez. And it's been a great honor to present with Professor Mackey and to work on the white paper with her. And I must say thank you for an absolutely fantastic, comprehensive talk on uh, cognition in the menopause transition, which is a very complex subject. Um, I will be sharing my slides with you just in one second. Um, what I'm going to be looking at is understanding and addressing risk factors for cognitive issues at midlife and beyond. I have no financial relationships to disclose. These are the topics I'm going to cover. How do women experience brain fog? How do you reassure and counsel your menopausal patients? Are there modifiable risk factors that are good for cognitive health? What cultural and ethnic the differences will we see in cognition and also something we cannot avoid talking about in this present climate long COVID brain fog and memory problems so how do women experience brain fog professor Mackey gave us a very excellent definition but just to put this talk in context i'd like to go over it your patients will come to you and tell you that having difficulty recalling words and numbers They'll talk about disturbances in daily life, misplacing items like keys. They've got trouble concentrating, absent-minded. They lose a train of thought. They get distracted. Very concerning, they forget appointments and events. What we can tell them is that symptom severity differs considerably across women and most often is in a milder range. And, but the trouble is that these memory problems and symptoms cause a lot of anxiety and do affect quality of life. 
So when these women come to your consulting room and they say, I'm really worried, I've got all these problems, I can't remember things, what must I do, am I getting dementia? You've got to be able to reassure him, them. And what concerns me is the huge amount of chatter that we see on social media about this. So I went looking for what's going on and lo and behold, you can see it's very scary. Most pictures of midlife women look like they're completely crazed. They're clutching their heads. They're scary photographs of some poor woman wandering in a dense fog and forest with a hundred trees and no hope of getting out of it. There are protests um, in the UK where women felt that they weren't getting, that their hormone therapy uh, prescriptions were running short. They appointed hormone therapy czars. And then you look at the headlines why you should take hormone therapy forever. Women who decide to take hormone therapy may be less likely to develop dementia because of their lifestyle, that it protects against dementia. Then they say health fairs as GPs wrongly give antidepressants to menopausal women. So there are a lot of chatter and talk and scary information out there. So how can you reassure and counsel your patients? The first thing you can tell them, as Professor Mackey stated, that some research did find that menopause-related cog cognitive problems may lead to dementia later in life. But you can reassure your patients, as Professor Mackey said, that these problems are very, very common in menopause and often mild, and they usually resolve post-menopause. Dementia, she said, at midlife is very rare. And the good take-home message, and it's important to tell your patients this, all women transition through menopause, but most women will not develop dementia. So we're going to look at, are there modifiable risk factors for better cognitive health? So while this woman is sitting in your uh, consulting room saying how worried she is, you can say to her, yes, there, it's, it's true that there are risk factors that are not modifiable, but there are ones that you can. So let's first discuss those risk factors that are not modifiable. These risk factors are age. So um, the older you get, the more likely you are to be at risk for dementia. Of course, gender, female sex. Across all regions of the world, dementia disproportionately affects women. More women live with dementia than men. The prevalence is higher for women than for men. Women are at more risk for developing dementia and the symptoms they live with are more severe. What about a genetic profile, family history, the apoloprotein E4 gene? What about those? So we could tell them, look, don't worry. Family history is not necessary for an individual to develop Alzheimer's. However, it's true that research shows that those who have a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease than those who do, do not have a first degree relative with Alzheimer's. And those who have more than one first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease are at an even higher risk. So this is true. But again, not all people with a family history develop Alzheimer's disease and early onset dementia, unless you've got a family history is very, very rare as Professor Mackey said. So what about chronic disease? Well, certain chronic disease does cause higher risk of a dementia, a coronary artery disease, chronic lung disease, this is true. And then we should look at early life experiences. Some very interesting research has shown that early life exposure to adverse childhood experiences, including parental loss, family psychopathology, and child maltreatment does lead to uh, an increased risk of dementia. So not necessarily, but the risk is increased. And direct associations of adverse childhood experience with dementia can be explained by studying the brain. And some individuals who experience adverse childhood um, experience so have depression, and depression, as we'll show later, is also increases risk for dementia in later life. What about socioeconomic adversity? And this is particularly true for low-income women and women in low- and middle-income countries. And we know that those individuals also are at greater risk for dementia, as are women, 
women who have had a limited educational opportunity, and again, many of those who are lower income or those who live in low and middle income countries, though the data on these are very scarce. And this relates to cognitive reserve, which is something we'll also discuss later and which Professor Mackey discussed. So what you can say to your patients is that, and this was shown in the Lancet guidelines, 40% of dementias worldwide are due to 12 modifiable risk factors, factors that you can change. Both the World Health and Lancet uh, Organization and Lancet guidelines agree on these specific modifiable risk factors. Less education, hypertension, hearing impairment, smoking, obesity, depression, physical inactivity, diabetes and low social contact, and those were shown in 2017. And in 2020, the Lancet guidelines added excessive alcohol consumption, traumatic brain injury and air pollution. And I have asked that Valentina put out the links to these in the, in the chat section after the talk so you can access them easily. This is very important. Midlife, which is the time of the menopause transition, is the optimum time to advise your patients on intervention and treatment strategies. A recent very large meta-analysis showed that in midlife women, five modifiable risk factors increased dementia by 41 to 78 percent. These were obesity, diabetes, smoking, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension. And the companion systematic review found three additional modifiable risk factors, hyperhomocystinemia, psychological stress, and heavy drinking. When you're talking to your patients, it's important to remember that a multi-domain lifestyle intervention is recommended to boost brain health. Uh, results from another very large systematic review and meta-analysis found that uh, healthcare practitioners, public health care organization, public health organizations, and individuals should lower risk factor exposure to, or keep it to a minimum, even if risk factors are present, to lower further increases. And these figures that I saw in this uh, systematic review were quite staggering. The dementia risk increases by 20% with one risk factor, 65% with two risk factors, and 200% with three factors. So it's absolutely clear that you should adopt a multi-pronged approach. This is a favorite diagram of mine. It's looking at heart health and seeing that it is a very strong link to brain health. So treating obesity, hypertension, and diabetes in midlife women to improve cognitive health. Now, a very large systematic review and meta-analysis showed that midlife hypertension is a risk factor for dementia. The SPRINT trial found that lowering blood pressure to a goal of 120 in adults aged 50 years and older prevented mild cognitive decline. And this is the preclinical stage of dementia. And we do know that high blood pressure affects many brain areas and systems and may cause heterogeneous cognitive outcomes. So again, it showed that a systolic blood pressure of greater than 130 is related to a 34% increased risk of cognitive dysfunction and dementia, while a lower a diastolic blood pressure lowered the risk for dementia. So I think it's very important to, to, to chat to your patients about this, to um, implement treatment strategies and to keep an eye on those women who have got a tendency for high blood pressure, especially at midlife. And this is a very nice graph that shows the dose response relationship between midlife systolic blood pressure and look how and the risk of cognitive disorders. The association between systolic blood pressure and midlife and the risk of cognitive disorders was positive and non-linear. What about overweight and obesity? Um, this certainly is an increased risk for cognitive decline and dementia. And in working on another talk, I found to my horror that potentially 1 billion people, and this is recent data in 2022 globally, will be living with obesity by 2030. 
Overweight and obesity are related to several medical issues like type 2 diabetes and cardiometabolic disease, um, high cholesterol, and hypertension, and new longitudinal data have shown us that there's an association between um, high blood pressure and dementia, and which we saw in the SPRINT trial, and the World Health Organization and Lancet guidelines for dementia uh, prevention recommends strategies to reduce both the risk of cardiometabolic disease and cognitive decline and or dementia. So all of these things go hand in hand. So what are the weight management strategies for brain health? There certainly are lifestyle interventions. Many women can adopt these. So what we would ask women is to maintain a healthy BMI between 18 and 25, to also go for a really good nutrition plan. Um, it's a key factor in controlling and lowering the risk of cognitive decline. And the World Health Organization actually highlights the Mediterranean diet, which has shown that long-term compliance with the Mediterranean diet, including a nice cons the consumption of fish, is associated with improved cognitive function. But here's the kicker. You can't just go on a Mediterranean diet for a couple of weeks and expect your cognitive function to improve. This is a long-term compliance that's needed but it's not terribly hard as we can see here it's a very nice diet and quite easy to adhere to and this is one of my favorite uh, photographs illustrating the, uh, the, the the Mediterranean diet you can see it's at a family table there's some delicious foods and of course um, a, a, a glass of wine which is very um, important so what we look at is that um, the Mediterranean diet, apologies for this, seems to have locked down and I'm not sure if we're going into, sorry, going back to this. The Mediterranean diet has been recognized by UNESCO as an intangible uh, cultural heritage of humanity. It's a world renowned healthy diet. It's not restricted to any one culture. It's acceptable to both non-Mediterranean and Mediterranean people. It's able to evolve. It's recognized as a healthy and sustainable diet. It's inspired a dietary guidelines worldwide. It's not a specific diet. It can say, contains a, a, a lot of information about healthy consumption of olive oil, nuts, vegetable, fruits and cereals, moderate fruit and poultry uh, consumption, low consumption, low portions of dairy products, red meats, um, uh, uh, sweet, sugary, fatty foods. And what's good about it, you can have wine in moderation with your meals. What about physical activity? That's vital for cognitive health. Longitudinal data has shown us that high levels of cardiovascular fitness are related to a lower risk. Women, interestingly, appear to be motivated to reduce dementia risk through physical activity. So if you can encourage women to improve their physical exercise, motivation seems high to do this, and studies have shown that. It's got multiple benefits. Recreational leisure time activities can be included. It doesn't have to be boring or ghastly. You can do walking, gardening, sports, dancing. If you do energetic household chores, not just drifting a duster across a shelf, but really scrubbing or polishing or sweeping, you can have planned daily exercise uh, sessions which many doctors can talk to their patients about. And again, you'll find there's a high level of compliance and also to do exercise in family and community settings. So go for a walk with your family, do exercise in a community setting because there you'll have the social engagement that we talk about that helps to lower the risk for uh, dementia and also have your physical activity. The World Health Organization recommends a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical exercise or 75 minutes of comparable vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity or an equivalent mix of both. But encourage your patients to start slowly and gradually progress to an increased level of physical activity. Don't let them just rush into it. That's not the way to go, but to build up bit by bit over the weeks. And this is one of my favorite cognitive behavioral uh, diagrams talking about uh, the virtuous circle of doing it. It, um, it. it requires people to 
exercise and reduces the temptation to exercise. Uh, regular exercise leads to improved concentration and willpower, and it helps people to stick to a healthy lifestyle, and it links exercise positively um, and helps to, with people's ability to engage in mental effort. What about social engagement and dementia risk? Both of these are essential determinants for well-being. They are a very important intervention in preventing cognitive decline, social isolation, loneliness, social, low social activity, and poor social contact um, or poor social support increase the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And the COVID epidemic did us no favors in this area with people really feeling isolated and being lonely. So it's a vital element and it's a very important modifiable risk factor. And if depression is, is um, present, then there's an added risk of dementia if depression is combined with inadequate social engagement. And finally, cognitive reserve. Challenge your brain. Increase cognitive skills, as, do as Dr. Mackey suggested. If you're educated, if you've got high levels of social, social interaction, you work in a cognitively challenging and interesting occupation, it can increase cognitive reserve. And there's a way of doing this by learning a new skill, learning a musical instrument, perhaps learn a language, encourage your patients to take on a new and challenging skill to improve their cognitive reserve. And both WHO and Lancet guidelines highlight the importance of cognitive reserve to protect cognitive health. And this is one of my favorite uh, life course models. It's in the Lancet guidelines, early life, less education, what happens at midlife, the hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, high blood pressure, alcohol, obesity, and then moving down to the other risk factors. So it's a very good diagram showing it. And these are the take home messages and we put them into a diagram. And I think it might be a useful diagram to share with your patients because it's very clear, heart health, brain health, treat the body, boost the brain, slow midlife wealth gain, a weight gain, smoke free, tell them to stay connected, let them exercise their brain and counsel them on the importance of all of these. Keep a multi-pronged approach for optimal cognitive health. Now, one of the things we need to look at is cultural and ethnic differences in cognition, that 6 million women worldwide will become menopausal annually, 76% will live in low and middle income countries, we know that the menopause transitions associated with cognitive decline, but there's very scarce data on the effect of the menopause transition and modifiable risk factors in these women. Menopause studies in high income countries cannot be indiscriminately applied to women in low and middle income countries. Cognitive performance of these women may vary from those in higher income countries because of factors that are substantially different across the countries, low education level, early childhood trauma and stressful life events, there are often war and uprisings and problems in these countries, poor nutrition, poor physical health and mental health, often because of very stressed public health resource systems. And again, lack of pharmacological treatment options for menopausal symptoms in many low middle income countries um, cause, is an issue. So it dictates a lifestyle focused approach, but again, many of these may be hard to access. Uh, so this is something must, one must approach with care. And the take home messages are, that it's don't generalize the data that we find in Western countries to women in low and middle income countries. It depends on many factors and we should inform these women of lifestyle interventions that could help their cardiometabolic health, talk about good diet, social relationships and physical activity, but information scarce. And in fact, we've been working on an information pamphlet in South Africa and Zimbabwe, which is giving women these, this information because they can't often access the internet. They don't have Wi-Fi. So we're putting these pamphlets out at public health clinics, which we hope will improve uh, people's relationship with these modifiable lifestyle risk factors. And finally, and very much an elephant in the room, long COVID, brain fog, and memory problems. What we have found, and this headline at the top, I've just seen in a very interesting article by Ed Young, 
who won a Pulitzer Prize for his health articles, especially writing about COVID. The CDC estimates that 19 million adults have long COVID. Women are disproportionately affected by it with persistent cognitive difficulties. A slight ray of hope is that executive function appears to be most strongly associated with long COVID, but not with the menopause transition. But it's very difficult to distinguish cognitive difficulties due to menopause from those due to uh, long COVID, even when menstrual irregularities, night switches, temperature and sleep disturbances are present, and menstrual cycle irregularities are, are associated with um, acute SARS-CoV-2 and with vaccination, and these may possibly be caused by short-term interruption of sex steroid hormone function, which may acutely worsen peri- and post-menopausal symptoms. But sadly, at this moment, there are insufficient data to guide identification of menopause versus uh, long COVID related cognitive issues and interventions. But more and more studies are coming out and there are quite a lot of recent studies that are showing that there are brain problems and that, as I would say in my take home messages, physicians should be careful because these symptoms are very similar, symptoms of long COVID and uh, cognitive symptoms of the menopause transition may lead to misdiagnosis. Information about long COVID should now be part of a medical history taking, and there's insufficient data to distinguish cognitive issues due to menopause from cognitive issues due to long COVID. So the topics I've covered are how women experience brain fog, how to reassure and counsel your patients, the modifiable risk factors that women can um, do something about to modify cognitive health, to help possibly prevent and even postpone dementia, to look at the cultural and ethnic differ differences in cognitive problems and cognitive health, and to also be aware of, what, of misdiagnosing symptoms caused by long COVID and those caused by the menopause transition. I would like to thank you for this, also apologize for some of the glitches that occurred during the presentation, and to say that there is a very nice consumer pamphlet that's coming out that you'll be able to give to your patients that accompanies the white paper on uh, cognition and will be available soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ja, for this uh, excellent presentation and the opportunity to hear from you uh, about some of the um, practical pearls for us to share with our patients and our colleagues. Um, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, and I noticed that uh, Professor Maki had a chance to address some of them um, online already. Um, I really welcome the 300 plus attendees that we have right now to really uh, wait in and, and enter your questions in the Q&A. I would just probably warm up the Q&A session by asking a question to Pauline. Um, Pauline, we, we saw the Lancet Commission and back in 2020 uh, basically uh, raising some important issues in terms of the modified factors for uh, dementia, early life, midlife, and later life. Can we translate that to a certain degree to modify factors for the brain fog, because we really don't know, uh, you know, yeah. the extent to which exercise or diet might help us to shrink the brain fog or shrink the duration of brain fog or improve some of those symptoms. Could you, could you comment on that if there's any evidence, either based on studies or clinically? Yeah, such an important question. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. So uh, it's amazing that all women who live into late life transition through menopause, and you'd think that we would know the protective and risk factors for brain fog, right? Who experiences the most severe? And we really don't. Um, there have not been systematic studies that have examined, for example, um, exercise in relation to the prevention of menopause-related brain fog, right? So um, that's where we have to generalize, rightly or wrongly from the vast um, and really reliable literature on in general, how do you keep your brain healthy, right? So that's um, what Dr. Jaff uh, presented there. I will say that we know much more about the menopause symptoms and their role 
in brain fog and we're, we're appreciating the sleep disturbance and the hot flash is a female specific risk factor for cognitive um, dysfunction at this time. But no, there have not been large randomized trials of exercise to see if that boosts, for example, um, cognitive function at this time, or if um, in particular, if treating, for example, um, hyperlipidemia is beneficial. So we just assume based on what we know about neurobiology, that the more reserve you have, the healthier your brain in general, it's kind of based on that premise, that the better your brain is when you hit menopause, the more of a hit you can take from these hormonal changes. And um, if you will maintain your, your good cognitive function. Thank you. A uh, question to Dr. Jaff, and it, that came early on in the Q and A uh, about the you know the pressure from social media and and all those uh, you know advertisements saying you know you're gonna lose your brain, you're gonna lose your mind. Uh, and then the question was really related to a woman's perception of her cognitive decline, whether there have been some studies or even your clinical impression, whether you know the perceptive, the subjective impact on memory and cognition might be due to you know social media pressure and everybody expecting that your brain will be working as well during the the brain fog or the menopause as opposed to objective uh, cognitive decline uh, any any thoughts on how to help women to disentangle those and to really be aware that maybe those changes are or you know transit or not as intense as the media portray them to be it's a really it's a very it's an important it's a great question and i think going back to dr mackie's talk where she said that there are studies that have validated uh, women's complaints that they're not just in their head and i think it's a i think a physician should, or healthcare practitioners need to be aware and say to women look it's not just in your head to actually tease out are these are validated complaints you're in the menopause transition these are quite normal. They usually resolve post-menopause. Let's talk about things we can do to help improve your cognitive health. And at the same time, address the issues that are shown on social media very clearly and say these are often scary. News likes to sell. What scare, sells news is not a sort of reassuring thing. These symptoms are mild, they will pass. You're going to feel better if you look after your health. No, they want to scare people. So I think if you can do a combination of evidence, which is that studies have shown that these are absolutely valid complaints, they do occur, it's not just in women's head, and then give them a regimen or some strategies to help their brain health, I think that might be able to help a bit. If I could add to Dr. Jeff's really important comments, I think it's a huge disservice to women to message that when they're experiencing these cognitive uh, issues, that it's the sign of something worse, like dementia. That's not evidence-based. It's frankly not evidence-based because as I showed, majority of these rebound. It's just a subset of women for whom these changes persist. And if, if I had to bet why they persist in those women, it's because they're, they remain symptomatic. They have a lot of hot flashes, they're waking up at night and they go untreated. It's not because they're on their way to dementia. Um, and, and most women who will not develop dementia, but what a, what a frightening experience, you know, to experience a memory lapse and go, oh my word, I think I'm getting demented. You know, and then this messaging that it's um, because they are huge disservice to women. We need to re reassure women that these are normal, um, that dementia at this age is really rare and that they're likely going to bounce back. So, Dr. Mike, you, you touch on two issues that were raised in the Q&A. Uh, one is the, the treatment of the menopausal related symptoms, like visual motor symptoms and sleep problems um, or depression, for that matter. Any evidence of uh, the treat by treating those symptoms either with hormonal therapy or antidepressants or any other strategies, if they make any difference for the prevention of dementia? In other words, uh, hormonal treatments versus no hormonal treatments for menopause related symptoms, do they matter? Do we know if they will have a different impact on risk for dementia or cognitive decline? Yeah, that's the $25,000 are we dating ourselves? Um, <laughs> unanswered question is whether or not um, treating 
women with moderate to severe hot flashes, if that's a good strategy for dementia prevention. And I'll tell you, based on some of the findings that we have from our randomized trials, I do think there's a sign there that it's really important to treat vasomotor symptoms, even independently of sleep. And the reason for that is, if, you, if you'll bear with me for 30 seconds, let's say I wanna know if hot flashes cause a brain change that's bad, okay? And I wanna treat it, if I treat with estrogen, to treat the hot flashes and memory bounces back. I don't know if it's because I've treated the hot flashes or if it's because estrogen is good for the brain, right? So I don't wanna use estrogen to test that hypothesis. So we use a non-hormonal intervention that took away hot flashes, but isn't known to improve memory, which was stellate ganglion blockade. It doesn't really matter what the intervention was, the logic persists. So if you treated those hot flashes, did memory bounce back? And the answer interestingly was yes it did bounce back, even though that treatment doesn't have an effect on memory systems that we know of. So that's proof of concept that treating those symptoms does in fact um, help memory to improve. And of course, the brain that we bring into the risk period for Alzheimer's disease is the brain that we come out of midlife with, right? So we want to have the healthiest brain. We want to optimize our memory function. So in general, any way that we can to memorize, uh, to, to optimize brain functioning, and that includes treating um, our hot flashes and improving our sleep, will help us bring a better brain into late life so that if the pathology of Alzheimer's disease begins to accumulate, your brain can resist it. Thank you. Um what about progesterones or you know bioidentical progesterone or progestins? Uh, do we have evidence on a, a protective effect for a cognitive decline or uh, any evidence, for instance, in women who went through surgical menopause if they could benefit from progesterone uh, or bioidentical progesterones for uh, to prevent memory decline? So um, as I mentioned in the chat, I really think it's important that we rely on randomized trials um, to answer these questions because of all the factors that confound use of hormone therapy, most importantly, at least in Western societies, access to healthcare, the extent to which your blood pressure gets checked when you go get your hormone therapy prescription filled, all of those things are confounded with the use of hormone therapy. For progesterone, there's actually one really um, interesting data point from the KEEP study, which was a large randomized trial of hormone therapy. And they did one of the sessions where they tested women when they were on progesterone plus estrogen versus estrogen alone. It made no difference. So there was not any benefit from um, micronized progesterone in that study. So that's the study that I go to for that time period. But as you know, Dr. Suarez is a leading psychiatrist in women's mental health. There may be some benefits to the metabolism of progesterone to allopregnan alone for women who are anxious. And there are a lot of women who have anxiety and we know that you know, it works on the GABA receptor to lower anxiety. So I can see a role uh, for a progestin in certain subgroups of women who may have kind of an anxious phenotype. That's purely theoretical. It's based on the PMDD and perinatal depression literature, but there may in fact be a role. And if I could just add to that fantastic explanation is to remember that bioidentical hormone, actually bioidentical is a more marketing term. So there are lots of very, very good Medical Council approved progesterones, micronized progesterones to use. So I would probably, if you, you're going to give your woman a, a micronized progesterone to give something that's approved by, med, you know, if they've got a womb and they need to protect their uterus, to give them one that is approved by a medical controlled council in whichever country you live in, rather than just a bioidentical product that may not have been approved. Thanks, Dr. Jeff. There's um, a question on the Q&A session that I think is actually um, for both speakers. It's really about um, the risk of dementia versus the impact on quality of life, right? So we just saw based on the data that you presented, Dr. Maki, that uh, it's really a small proportion of women that would develop dementia, but there are a lot of questions about the impact of the uh, cognitive decline on quality of life and functioning. Uh, with that in mind, should we should we bet more on you know lifestyle changes, Mediterranean diet, ketogenic diet, exercise, or on the other hand, hormonal therapy to help us to improve overall quality of life and functioning? The, the answer might be all of the above, but could you elaborate a little bit on the evidence or 
how good or bad the evidence or probably insufficient for quality of life and overall functioning in menopause and the role of hormonal and non-hormonal interventions. Yeah, thank you for that. So we know from um, meta-analyses and systematic reviews that menopausal hormone therapy certainly improves menopause-related quality of life. The extent to which that generalizes beyond menopause-related quality of life to other aspects of quality of life is uncertain and unreliable in the literature. We know from elegant studies that there is a subgroup of women for whom the withdrawal of estrogen triggers a lot of psychological symptoms and overall um, poor well-being. And we don't want to have any kind of stopping rule that says don't treat those women. If we know from, you know, our, our experience um, treating them that if you withdraw them from hormones, um, they're going to have a rebound, say, in depression, right? So there's a subgroup of women who are vulnerable. And Dr. Suarez, your research is what I cite all the time when I talk about this, the, the benefits of treating certain women with um, estradiol. So that might be a subgroup of women for whom this quality of life related thing, because quality of life is often their psychological well-being, you know, the extent to which they feel invested, they don't have anhedonia, they like, you know, engaging in their life. So there may be that type of women, but I don't think that's the majority of women. Um, I think that's a subgroup of women. And I think women, we know the benefits of exercise, right? I'm sure everybody's trying to get their patients to exercise more. If you say that it prevents Alzheimer's disease, maybe you'll be more successful in doing that, right? Um, Mediterranean diet makes people feel better. So there's a lot of things that impact quality of life um, that have nothing to do with menopause. I don't want to minimize menopause because as you know, I've dedicated my life to it, but I don't want to overgeneralize and say that all of women's cognitive health has to do with their hormones. It's certainly not where the literature leads us. Yeah, I would, I would really concur with that. And I think the most important thing is to stop women being so scared. I mean, the, it's clear that quality of life, if you're exercising and you feel good and you're not overweight and you're socially engaged and your brain's working because you're trying a new skill and you're eating healthy foods that don't sort of make you feel, you know, heavy and miserable and social contacts improving feelings of loneliness and depression, all of those, everything applies to quality of life. And to just focus on one small thing during that menopause transition, during a whole stage of a woman's life, it's almost for me quite cruel. And to go back to what Professor Mackey said earlier, literally, it's a terrible thing for women to think they're going to have dementia, that they're so anxious and worried. I mean, all of the things that are suggested are good things, not only during menopause, but for their life health for cardiometabolic disease risk, for, for all of these things. So, you know, it's not just hormone therapy treatment, I would say, and not just their hormones. Thank you. There, there are a couple of questions about um, specific populations that I think would be uh, interesting for the whole group to, um, to get your thoughts on. One is about patients with breast cancer who are treated with, uh, you know, tamoxifen or other hormone suppressors who are known to potentially cause some cognitive deficits. Any thoughts on the lingering brain fog due to tamoxifen and how much we know or don't know? And the other question is about genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's disease. And, and of those, if those women with known genetic predisposition would potentially benefit from hormonal therapy more so than others. Yeah, so let me start with the breast cancer question. And thank you for that question. Uh, so there's a, a very large study that looked at aromatase inhibitors and their role on co in cognition in women who have transitioned through the menopause. It's called IBIS, and it showed no lingering harm from treatment in the postmenopause. In premenopausal women, there is a subgroup of women who um, experience cognitive fog persistently after treatment. And it, in my mind, I think they're the same women who are sensitive to estrogen withdrawal after the menopause, that you just, you have um, unmasked this phenotype and it's a real phenotype. And the challenge is that we don't quite know 
you know, how to treat that phenotype. And I think the idea of building a stronger brain makes a lot of sense. I'm excited about the possibility of the NK3 antagonists being helpful for preventing hot flash related treatment when those studies are done in women with, with breast cancer, an important um, potential cognitive sparing um, intervention for those women. Um, but uh, for most women with who go through um, treatment for breast cancer, it's not a permanent, uh, but there is this subgroup of women and the same factors that we're saying are beneficial for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease are really beneficial for, for women um, with breast cancer. Uh, in terms of uh, genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, here we're talking about the apolipoprotein E4 allele or ApoE4. So what's known about this? Well, there's data from KEEPS, a neuroimaging study that suggested that to the extent that there's benefit with transdermal estradiol, um, that it's observed among the women with ApoE4. So in that study, it was women who were what we call E4 carriers or E4 positive that showed a decrease in their brain amyloid. Um, following randomization to that. And they didn't see that with conjugated equine estrogen, which is interesting because the WHI showed a signal with CEE. So there the data aren't really consistent, but proof of concept that maybe transdermal estradiol is beneficial in women who are E4 positive. Uh, the data on um, E4 is mixed in the literature generally when it comes to hormone therapy. Some studies suggest that E4 positive women get the most benefit. Other studies suggest the opposite. So there's really no clear signal in, in the literature for me to say anything you know, definitive about that. The good news is though, even if you're E4 positive and perhaps especially if you're E4 positive, exercise is very beneficial in lowering the risk of dementia according to large Scandinavian studies. So it's not deterministic. Even if you carry that, there's, um, there are lifestyle changes that you can engage in to protect your brain. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Professor Maki, for, for your answers. Uh, we have uh, many, many questions in the Q&A, but unfortunately, we are getting close to our um, final time here. But I want to give a chance to Dr. Jaff to maybe make some comments on, um, you mentioned uh, the importance of sharing or motivating women uh, for both lifestyle changes in terms of a diet and exercise. Any, any practical tips that you learn by talking to colleagues and patients and providers on what are the, the best techniques or tactics to motivate people to start it? Because we know, for instance, for exercise, that that positive feedback that you show is quite helpful. But quite often, it's very hard to get people to start it and to really experience that positive feedback. Any, any suggestions or tips that you learn uh, that can be helpful for us as we try to motivate women to engage in exercise and a healthy diet? Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Yes, it is hard because most of us would rather, well, some of us like me, would rather lie on a bed with a chocolate and a book than exercising. But I think if one engages with women in a way that is interactive, not just sitting there being prescriptive, you must do 150 minutes of exercise, but finding out, teasing out, what sort of exercise do you like? Do you know if you did this amount of exercise a week, it would be protective for brain health? How about your diet? Let's see what you eat. You don't have to be rigorous. You don't have to give up everything. You can eat foods that are very appealing, like in the Mediterranean diet. You can even have a glass of wine once or twice a week at a meal. There are good things to do, but to interact with the patient, not to sit there laying down the law. And I found that if I'm prescriptive, women sort of pull back and they block. It's better to be interactive and to say to them, what sort of foods do you like? What exercise do you like? Do you know that if you exercise, it can help you with cognition? To literally use your time with those women to see what happens. And if and when they come back to you to encourage them, I see you've been working on your weight. How great, how's your exercise going? To have some sort of a connection so that each time they come to you, they feel encouraged, not despairing. And to explain to them that change takes time and it takes time to get into a good regime and to just persevere. One bad day doesn't mean that you have to give something up. Keep going. It will protect your brain health. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffa, Professor Maki, for not only your excellent presentations, but to share your wisdom, your, your clinical experience, and your knowledge on the field. Uh, I think we're getting close to the time to end our webinar. I want to thank uh, the almost 300 people who stay into the very end and, and join us for this past hour, almost an hour and a half, and the organizers for inviting both myself, um, but also Professor Mack and Dr. Jaff. And I want to wish you all a good uh, good day or good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.